Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship this morning. My name is Megan Otto. I'm the director of campus ministries here at the church, and I am glad to see your faces here in worship. We will continue our series today on the scripture with a twist, and Pastor John will be exploring the story of the Tower of Babel and how diversity is something to be celebrated. Our prelude and postlude today are a piece called Variations on the Norwegian Hymn, Oh, how glory it shall be for the children of God, by Bjarnin Schlugudel. Since the theme for Sunday is diversity, this is a piece from a country not well rep represented in organ literature, and it has five variations which treat the same hymn in diverse ways. We hope the words and music of this service speak to your heart as we worship together. Welcome. We're so glad you're here.
our service for you to pass the peace. So I encourage you to share signs of peace with your neighbors in the chat or those in your household with you. The peace of Christ be with you. The birth of a child is an event so wonderful, so humbling, and yet so awe-inspiring that all faith traditions of the world have a ritual of welcome and blessing. We join our hearts and voices with faith communities of every kind and in every age as we offer thanks and seek blessings today. Baptism is a sacrament of the church. It's a sign of God's love acting in our lives. Through baptism, we're received into the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. For us, the water is symbolic of life itself, the waters of a mother's womb, as well as the water out of which all life is created and sustained. The water is also the symbol of the life-giving power of God's love working in the world. God's love is poured out on all creation, and that love overflows in us in love for all our neighbors. Friends, we are so happy to be celebrating the baptism of Elizabeth Mitchell today. Her parents, Taylor and Brian, moved to Austin a few years ago and found our church online during the pandemic. So we welcome all of you into the life of this church and we're delighted to be part of this great day. Taylor and Brian, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you these questions. Do you accept God's call to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you accept Jesus as the sign of God's unconditional grace and as the source of your freedom to act boldly in this world? I do. I do. Do you promise your love, support, and care for Elizabeth as she grows in Christ? We do. We do. By the grace of God, do you promise to follow Christ and to grow with her in a Christian faith? Will you help her to be a faithful member of this community Celebrate the presence of God's Spirit in all of life. By God's grace, we will. I have a question for the godparents. One is in the sphere, and the other one is on Facebook. Godparents fill a special role in the life of a child. In accepting the role of godparents, you promise to participate in the life of this child, to assist the parents in her spiritual growth and development. Do you, as the godparents of this child, promise to share responsibility? with Taylor and Brian, with this precious child, to pray for her, to walk with her in the way of Christ, and to help her find her place within the church? If so, your answer is, with God's help, I will. With God's help, I will. Blake. University United Methodist Church, each one of us has an important role to play. This family will need a community of love and forgiveness as they grow in their faith and their service to God. Will all of you help provide that community and teach these friends to be faithful witnesses to God's love and God's justice? With God's help, we will. Let us profess our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Lord made flesh, 
to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. We give you thanks, O Holy One, Mother and Father of all of the faithful, for this child and for your grace present here today. Pour out your spirit to bless this gift of water and the one who receives it, to liberate and guide them throughout their lives into the joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life through Jesus Christ, who makes us one. Taylor and Bryant, what name is given this child? Elizabeth Blake Mitchell. Elizabeth Blake. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want to gather and lay hands on her and say a prayer. May God work within you that being born of water and spirit, you may ever be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And now, as your new church family, it is our joy to welcome all of you in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated in Christ's new creation by the power of God's Spirit. With joy and thanks, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. As in baptism, you put on Christ, so in Christ may you be clothed in glory. Amen. Please welcome Elizabeth by clapping and commenting in the chat box. <laughs> Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Startle us, O oh God, with truth so big, so glorious, words will never contain it. Startle us with love that overcomes all even death. In this Easter season, open our eyes to see your loving, reconciling work in our world. Open our ears so that we may hear your voice in the voice of others. Open our hearts to a love that assures us that there is nothing to fear ever, for Jesus is not dead, but risen. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butmen for martyr. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Yahweh came to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And Yahweh said, Look, there are one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel because there Yahweh confused the language of all the earth. And from there, Yahweh scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of life. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
my goodness gracious, such great twisting to conclude our series today. Now, I know that many of you were still waiting on your poodle skirt and your leather jacket from Amazon to dress the part, and they didn't come in in time. That's okay. I'm sure you'll have another chance to dance, especially if you stick around University United Methodist Church. The grace, mercy, and peace of the triune God be with you all. Amen. We have been talking a whole bunch over the last month or so about some of the great stories in Scripture and how they've often been mishandled and misinterpreted and, and voided of meaning by, by interpreters and, and how with a righteous Jesus twist they suddenly begin to make sense and become life-giving instead of life-draining. Like texts about the trees clapping their hands and the mountains singing out with joy. And what if we took that a bit more literally? Admittedly, a tough sell to a progressive congregation. Okay, say what, you want us to be more literal now? But it's, it's something that I think would yield a much more animated and lively view of life on the planet. We've talked about racism, guns, homelessness, not as, as, as issues of the day, but as moral arguments that our faith drives us to embrace. Well, today we're back in Genesis with the story of the Tower of Babel, some amazing artwork of that tower uh, that you ought to check out. Well, according to this story, the whole world was speaking the same language. And some among them decided to build a great tower, one that would make them known for generations. They had, however, skipped one key step, consulting with the building contractor of the planet Earth, God who was just a little put out with the idea of a tower whose spire might come poking up through the clouds of heaven. And so what the people had tried to avoid, that they would be scattered across the face of the earth, that's precisely what happened. Building on the tower came to a halt. Folks banded up into tribes that spoke the same language and off they went to populate the earth and begin human history as we know it. If you read the other stories that precede this one in Genesis, this story looks like the final chapter in the sin punishment formula. Adam and Eve sinned, they're kicked out of the garden. Cain sinned, he's booted over to the next town. Noah's entire generation sinned, a terrible flood lays waste to the world and and now we have the Tower of Babel, where humans have become arrogant and haughty. You see, this is not something new with the 21st century. Thinking they are as good as God, and, and God punishes them by dispersing them across the face of the earth. Okay, but what if that's not the point of the story of, of the Tower of Babel. What if diversity is not God's punishment on human sinfulness? What if something else completely different is going on here? Twist. Emmanuel Larty is a professor of pastoral theology at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta. He was raised in Ghana. And he uses the lens of colonialism to understand the Babel story. He says the story is not about God punishing people with diversity. It's not about that. It's about, listen closely to this, it's about God's judgment on the way one people can become so dominant the way they can impose language and culture and control on everyone, taking over everyone's life in the process. So Lardy says that 
God wasn't punishing them by giving them different languages. God was saving them, saving them from themselves by confusing their language and diffusing their world dominance project. God liberates the world from the boot of the tower builders and, wo and opens the world up to, to the beautiful diversity of humankind. Wow. <laughs> If that is not the coolest twist ever. On this reading, God decides for a world filled with difference. God decides that it would be really good to have a world where everyone sees the same thing, but in a different way and calls it by a different name. Now I've mentioned before I think that Linda and I are often mesmerized by the birds that gather at our feeder in the backyard. It's like we're looking at birds for the first time. Cardinals and, and pigeons and wrens and chickadees and goldfinches. We're beginning even to recognize some of them by their different calls when they're way off in the trees behind our house. We cannot imagine for even an instant how dull the world would be if all birds were the same. Can you imagine? So, why should it be any different for humans? Diversity, my friends, is a gift of God. Diversity is, after all, what God had in mind from the very beginning. God said, be fruitful and, and multiply and fill the earth. But that email wound up in the tower builder's spam folder. So they, they gathered in one place with one language and they plotted together and schemed to do this one big thing together. And they were rescued. They were rescued by being scattered. In our time, I believe that, that those who cannot seem to live with diversity, have you seen the rise in Asian hate crimes, for example? Those who cannot live with diversity, they commit the same sin as the tower builders. The arrogant worship of lifeless uniformity. Okay. Diversion, d diversity, diversity is in the creation story in Genesis 1. Although it's kind of hidden away in there. So let's, let's think about this. It's the final sermon in the series, so you're ready for another twist, right? Okay, buckle up. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, it sounds kind of like a list, which it is. It is a list. It's an ancient liturgy giving thanks for creation, and it's in binary patterns, light and darkness, heaven and earth, land and sea, the final binary is male and female. Now, for some, that God created male and female means that's it. There are males and females, period. The Bible says it, I believe it, and okay, you know the rest of that thing by now. United Methodist Deacon former staff member of University Church and friend, M. Barclay, sees it a bit differently. Okay, listen to this. This chapter, M. writes, talks about night and day and land and water, but we have dusk and we have marshes. These verses don't mean there's only land and water. And there's nowhere where these two meet. These binaries aren't meant to speak of all of reality. They invite us into thinking about everything between and beyond the binaries. Think about that. 
When we call God the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, we mean not just the beginning and the end, right? But that God encompasses everything in between and everything beyond, right? The biblical authors in Genesis are using a poetic metaphor to corral the infinite diversity of creation into some kind of pattern that makes sense. But creation is not limited to the binaries. These metaphors invite us to think of everything in between and everything beyond the binaries. And so for me, the lesson of Genesis is clear. God chose variety over uniformity. All of it created by God. All of it good. Which means that while most of us like to be in places where everything looks like us and speaks like us, God is inviting us into the adventure of being with people who are, who are as different from each other and from us as well, night and day, and everything in between and beyond. You know, one of the very best things about this congregation is that you have taken that kind of radical welcome and inclusion as a gospel mantra. Early on, you invited women into the clergy leadership of this church. Way, way back in the 70s and 80s, you openly welcomed gay and lesb lesbian persons into the life of this congregation. You studied for over a decade about becoming a more welcoming congregation, and in 2011, you became a reconciling church. Time for some hand clapping at home. When General Conference lost track of the gospel in 2019, you supported your clergy as we pushed for LGBTQ equality in ordination and in marriage in the church. You supported Pastor, and Lisa, Pastor Lisa and me as we worked with other reconciling clergy at the 2019 annual conference to create the most progressive delegation to General Conference ever. And whenever a General Conference gets around to meeting, they're going to do some amazing things. You told the bishop that even if they took away my orders for performing a same-gender wedding, that I would still be your pastor. I will never forget that. And I will always love you for that. At University Church, you have taken seriously the call to be as inclusive as you can possibly be. It is your superpower. It is. You have your radar set for those who are on the outside and you are always wondering how can we open our doors wider and wider and wider to everyone in between and beyond. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A couple of weeks ago, a student asked me if they could use our sanctuary for a film project. About once or twice a year this happens. And I'll call this person James. We talked on the phone and James shared about growing up in the church and having questions about gender and the church rejecting them. They went through a time of really great anger and, and hurt that those who are supposed to embody God's love were anything but loving. Over time, James came to a place where they wanted to reconcile with God and decided to film it in a church. But what church? I mean, James wasn't going to church anymore. And then they thought, I know, I know. 
I'll go to that church I pass on the way to class, the one with the rainbow doors. I watched the final cut of the video they shot in our sanctuary last week. Such vulnerability and, and authenticity. I cannot believe some days that I get to be a part of things like this, mostly because of who you are. The church with the rainbow doors. Now you know that you're not all the way there yet, but you press on, knowing that in this work lies your very salvation. Thanks be to God, my friends, for the mighty work that God has done through you and all of God's people and all of God's creation and everything in between and beyond said, Amen and Amen. I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession. Almighty God, through your Holy Spirit, you created unity in the midst of diversity. We acknowledge that human diversity is an expression of your manifold love for your creation. We confess that in our brokenness as human beings, we turn diversity into a source of alienation, injustice, oppression, and wounding. Empower us to recognize and celebrate differences as your great gift to the human family. Enable us to be architects of understanding, of respect, and love. Through the one God, the ground of all unity, we pray. Amen. Hey everybody, my name is Sydney Harkrider and I am the Director of Youth Ministries here at University UMC. Today is actually Senior Sunday, which means we get to celebrate our seniors graduating from high school, but as well as those graduating from college. Um, but before we do that, will you please join me in a prayer for these students? Gracious and loving God, today we lift up and give thanks for these graduates. We are grateful for their support of this church and commitment to their faith in you. We pray that you will guide their next steps, no matter where they lead. We hope they remember that you are always close to them and that they are so dearly loved, exactly who they are in this moment, not as they wish or hope to be, but as they are right now. We pray that they will continue to fight for social justice and welcome a stranger. Please grant them opportunities to see you and everyone that they meet. We pray for their parents and their friends who have guided and supported them along this journey. We also give thanks for this congregation and their commitment to supporting a new generation of progressive Christians ready to change the world. In your son's name, amen. Now please enjoy this video and all these videos celebrating these students. My name is Erica Muma and my parents are Carol Kim and Paul Muma and I'm graduating from McCallum High School and I will be attending San Diego State University in the fall. And one of my favorite memories from UUMC is the Easter egg hunt at the Little Field House. since the fall of 2018, I believe. The Far Requiem was my first performance with you all. 
and I'm about to graduate from Texas State University in San Marcos with my degree in music studies with my all level teaching certification. And right now I'm applying to and interviewing for jobs all over Texas. I have no idea where I'm going to end up, but it would make me very happy if I was in the Austin area and could continue singing with you all, but we'll see, I'm open. And my best memory of my time at UUMC would definitely be all of the rehearsals for Lessons and Carols. The Christmas season is has been so wonderful and I love the music. I already mentioned Masters in this Hall dance is my favorite and I will I will miss those times very very much. Hi everybody. My name is Will. I'm a bass section leader at the UMC choir. Uh, I've been here for a little over 2 years now. It was February 2019 when I first joined. Uh, I'm graduating from Texas State University with my degree in marketing and I'm planning to get a job in that field when I graduate. I hope to work in as a marketing specialist or a consultant somewhere, but I'm expecting to maybe start working in sales first and move up a little bit before that happens. Um, I would say probably my best memory with UMC, an easy answer to this would be the Italy trip when we got to uh, tour throughout the whole country of Italy for about 10 days. Um, but I feel like a lot of my choir members could relate more to our performance of the Dorchester Canticles and kind of what a journey that was and the process of learning it and sort of figuring that out and eventually performing it live for the entire church choir and that I think that was a really fun experience despite how hard it might have been for all of us but uh, it was it was really fun and I'm looking forward to graduating and still singing with everybody I'm, I'm still going to be here for a while I'm I'm until I get a job hopefully I'll be in Austin but um, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone again soon. Hi. My name is George Sani, and I've been part of the UUMC Choir for three years. Um, I am graduating from Texas State University with a BA in Music and a minor in Sports and Exercise Science. After college, I plan to continue serving United University Methodist Church as a choral scholar, as well as uh, I've been substitute teaching for Lockhart Independent School District, and I hope to seek a more permanent and full-time position with them. Um, my favorite memory has to be riding the carousel full of the many fun animal animals uh, in SCC Italy and uh, I look forward to the many more opportunities and memories that I will be making with University United Methodist Church. Hi all, my name is Claire Carter and I'm from San Antonio. I'm graduating with a Master's of Science in Speech Language and Hearing Sciences and after graduation I will be moving to Dallas to work as a speech language pathologist in a preschool, specifically in their deaf education program. Um, some of my favorite things at UUMC was how quickly I was welcomed um, into this community and really found meaningful community um, with other students. And um, my other favorite thing was that this church is not afraid to um, speak on topics where we feel the Lord is pulling us um, into instead of just sticking to what is comfortable. So I'm going to miss y'all, but I am so grateful for the time that I had at UUMC. And um, I know that um, I still have this community even when I move. So thanks y'all, love you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Kate Scribner. I'm from Plano, Texas. I'm a senior journalism major. And as for my plans post-graduation, I plan on accepting a job offer for a senior communications specialist role at a technology company back home. And as for my favorite things about UUMC, I would say the mission is really what comes to mind first. This desire to fight for social justice and inclusiveness and reconciliation and to provide healing and uh, spiritual sanctuary in what can only be described as a broken and imperfect world. Um, the sense of community is very important to me. I remember starting as a freshman at UT and being so nervous about finding a church home where I felt safe and welcomed and comfortable. Um, and UUMC was right across the street from where I was living. And so I thought I'd give it a go. And it was the first and only church that I looked at because it felt like home. And Megan's cooking, especially her desserts, just incredible. And um, also just, just knowing that even if 
life gets crazy and I have a million things that I have to do for school um, and I'm just not able to make it consistently every Sunday. I know that um, when I do go, I'll be welcomed as if I've never been gone. So very grateful for all that UUMC has done for me these past four years. Hi, I'm Malin Saladitas. I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, my degree is in computational chemistry and biochemistry, and I will be attending Rice University to seek my PhD in biochemistry after I graduate. And my favorite thing about the UUMC is Megan. She is so welcoming and has made this time in college just so much better. We are so grateful that you continue to support the mission and ministries of University United Methodist Church. Thank you for that. Today, if you would like to donate towards a love offering for Pastor John and Linda to celebrate the, their, his years of ministry and leadership at UUMC, you can go to our website, uumc.org, find the donate button, and make sure you write love offering in the memo line. And as always, thank you.
to join us for a Lunch and Learn at noon following the service today. You can find the link below the service on YouTube or it is also in the eConnection. We will be talking with Andrea Brower and about the current legislature and what is happening with gun laws in Texas. Andrea is a licensed social worker, foster parent, and advocate here in Austin. She spent 15 years working for public policy for the Texas legislature. And from 2015 to 2017, Andrea was the executive director of Texas Gun Sense, advocating for, for common sense, evidence-based policies to reduce gun violence. I hope that you will join us for that. It's not too late to register to attend an outdoor reception for Pastor John and Linda at the Umlauf Sculpture Garden next Sunday afternoon. You can find registration links in the eConnection and we hope to see you there. Our closing hymn today is O Day of Peace That Dimly Shines. Let us join together. blessing and benediction. Go in peace. Go in love. And don't be afraid to use your superpower, even when we're apart. Let's find ways to continue to embrace those who are othered, those who are marginalized, those who are under the boot of our modern tower builders, Let's find ways to embrace everyone in between and beyond. Embrace them as family because they are. And may the blessing of God go with you each step of your journey this week. Amen. <laughs>